so let me welcome everyone to the first morning session of the of the mathem of the mathematics part of the conference. Um, so we will start today with the first mini course, um, and it's by Rod Gover, who's actually supposed to be here, but he couldn't come, unfortunately. And now he's he's giving his lecture via Zoom. And it's about um, conformal and protective techniques in general relativity. So, all right. So, thank you very much, Katya, and thanks very much um, to the organizers. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking here. Um, I'm very sad to not be there. Um, so, I had everything arranged to travel, uh, including insurance um, in Poland and in Austria, but then I couldn't get a um, quarantine spot to come back to New Zealand, so I couldn't come. Okay, anyway, let's to get started here. Um, so yeah, first of all, a warning that this is going to be very elementary for those people who already know about um, some of these things like tractors and, and um, the boundary calculus and so on, but um, otherwise, I hope hopefully it's useful. So in here, um, I've got a couple of background things. In particular, for the first lecture here, um, this first one's very relevant, um, which is a kind of um, survey of some of the re results up to the time we wrote it, which was in about 2014. Um, but the things that uh, I'll cover today will be mainly in there. Um, yeah, OK. so. So first of all, so here's the sort of program for today's lecture. So there'll be some very basic geometry. Um, and then I'll talk to um, the motivation for conformal geometry, um, which is going to come from the compactification problem. Um, and yeah, and what I call the geometry of scale. So, so a little warning down here, apart from it being elementary, is that the dimension will often be or usually be D, which is n plus one. <laughs> okay, so that so n will appear later on in lecture three. The dimension will go to dimension n. Um, this is mainly because I'm using old slides with different conventions and so on, so it'll make sense. Um, and here's a picture of the world um, with the holonomy situation of the world. Um, <clears throat> so of course this is just set in E3, if you like. So it's a sphere in Euclidean three space, and it's the usual thing of transporting a vector around and finding out that it does a rotation. But, um, well, first of all, I wanted to mention it because some of the other things I'll be saying are not really much more complicated than that, but they'll, they'll yield rather remarkable results. So, um, you know, you think of E3, Euclidean three space, as being a relatively trivial geometry, but it induces on the sphere a much more interesting geometry, as indeed sailors and navigators discovered when they found out about this problem of um, you know, triangles having the wrong number of angles internally and so on. Um, the other reason I want to include this is that this arrow here points to this, um, is it the Missouri and Lakes District in Poland? So I thought I'd include that. Okay, so anyway, apart from Euclidean geometry, we get an obvious variant of this, which is, um, which is pseudo Euclidean geometry, if you like. So you replace the dot product with a dot product with a signature. And so I'm giving you my convention for signatures here. Um, so PQ will mean Q minuses. And of course, the most famous one and relevant for what I'm talking about here is Minkowski space, which has one minus. So uh, a Minkowski dot product might look like that, NXY with the minus there and all pluses otherwise. And then, um, well, this has some interesting features that weren't in, in um, the Euclidean case. Namely, there are, you can have non-zero vectors which have zero length according to the Minkowski inner product, and you even get a null cone of such. And we'll be talking later about null cones, so I wanted to fix that idea in here. And then here's a little course in special relativity here. Um, we know that the group um, ON minus 1, 1 that preserves this sort of Min Minkowski dot product um, obviously preserves the null cone. And um, it's then easy to see from that that you get a space-time geometry where the speed of light is the same in all frames. Um, and that was required by the Michelson, well, as, as sort of observed in the michelson morley experiments. And then that was all linked to special relativity. Okay. So then um, in this very basic geometry background, 
Um, this is generalized by pseudo Euclidean, pseudo Romanian geometry rather, which <clears throat> starts with a manifold um, of dimension, let's say D here. Um, but then the tangent space at every point is equipped with one of those um, dot products, so pseudo Euclidean dot products, except in a point dependent way. So that's what you call a metric um, and you know, can have signature PQ. And of course, the idea of GR is that space time is well modeled by a Lorentzian signature pseudo Romanian manifold. In a sense, it's one of the main points of GR. And the Einstein equations um, give you a way of determining the geometry. But the, the first idea is that that structure is going to be good for space time. OK, but then the key thing perhaps to note from this, because everyone knows everything I'm saying here, but just to remind ourselves how, how you then get going with doing analysis on a pseudo um, Romanian manifold, um, the metric G determines a connection by the Cazul formula. So, um, and it's the unique connection preserving the metric that's torsion free. Um, <clears throat> and that gives us a way of transporting vectors along curves like we saw in that map of the world, you know, you get local holonomy and so on. Um, and then from the connection, you get a notion of curvature, you get invariance, and most importantly, perhaps you get natural operators and equations. And perhaps the most well-known one is, is to do with Laplace Laplacian, which you get by a sort of minimal coupling, if you like, that of the metric with the geometry. Um, that's the usual metric Laplacian. And then you have the Einstein equations that the Ricci curvature is proportional to the metric. So these are sort of, we're using natural invariance to make equations. The Einstein equation is one such. So I'm mentioning that because when we go to, for instance, conformal geometry, we have to think again about how to, how to get analysis and things going. And, the, and, there's, and there's sort of another spin on it that I'll come to towards the end. Okay, so that, so that was part zero. That's the bit that everyone's supposed to know. Um, and here's part one, which is um, <clears throat> only the stuff that everyone knows that's seen my talks before. <laughs> okay, but here's the question. So suppose we have a, um, an infinite space time, meaning, um, or, or, or geometry, right? Meaning um, more precisely a non-compact manifold that's geodesically complete. Okay, so I've got a picture there that I hope you can see. Looks all right in my screen, but it might not project well onto the wall. Um, but anyway, it's just indicating a manifold like that. So some sort of non-compact, geodesically complete manifold. Now, the question is how you deal with, you know, this far region that goes off to infinity. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what, what can you do to make this sort of mathematically um, tractable to do something with it? Um, so can we make a notion that's mathematically useful? Um, and if so, what geometry is going to be out there? Um, and then there's going to be questions of uniqueness. You know, is it essentially unique? And I see essentially is misspelled there, but we'll put up with that. Um, so a way of uh, dealing with the first question, how we deal with the far region, um, is usually, and here it's going to be by what's called compactification. And in a topological sense, what it means is that um, <clears throat> you just, it's an embedding of your space that's non-compact as a dense subset um, in a compact space. Okay, so you have a map from M into M bar, which is, um, M bar is gonna be the compact one. And this map should be injective, continuous and a homeomorph homeomorphism onto its image. Now, of course, because we're differential geometers or perhaps physicists, we want things to be smooth, at least pretty smooth. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, I'll come to that. Okay, here, here's an example that, again, everyone knows, but this will um, sort of remind us how to think about these things. So <clears throat> Euclidean space itself is pretty big. <laughs> you know, if you draw this picture of E2, for instance, it just goes on forever in all directions. So how do you, how would you deal with that mathematically? Even if you were doing things numerically and you wanted to put a grid on this, what are you going to do? Have an infinite number of points going out to infinity. You know, so you have to think of how to practically manage it. And then for analysis, there are, of course, corresponding issues. Now, this one solution, which is the sort I will be talking about, is to add some points so that um, your non-compact space becomes compact, right? So you have to do this strategically. Um, 
<clears throat> and of course, for Euclidean space, there's a sort of very well-known compactification that, that you all know, which is stereographic projection. So what you do is you take a, a medicine ball and you sit it on your Euclidean space, um, and then you do projections from the North Pole um, by a straight line down to your Euclidean space, and you find the point in the sphere um, that gets mapped to that point in Euclidean space, just you know, the point on the straight line that where it intersects the sphere, apart from the North Pole, um, is identified with the point where it lands in Euclidean space. And that gives a one-to-one um, -one map, even if, in fact a diffeomorphism, um, of the sphere minus its North Pole onto Euclidean space. Now, the sphere, of course, is um, famously compact. So what you've done is a one-point compactification of Euclidean space. So, so the you know, Euclidean space has been mapped to the sphere, um, except for the one point, and then, you know, that point gives you the compactification. Okay, now, um, another feature of that is that it's conformal. So this mapping actually preserves angles. So let's say that's what conformal means at the moment. Um, it doesn't obviously doesn't preserve lengths, but it preserves angles. So it's a really good compactification in that sense because it preserves, you know, sort of in some sense, most of the information about the metric. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I'm sort of leading in here to, to the way we're gonna think about this in this talk. Um, so for us, as I said, compactifications will have to be smooth and otherwise, like I was saying above, so it'll be an injective map um, and M will be open and dense in its image. And what I want to ask is what is the right way to do this when geometry is involved? So just as a smooth thing, it's already perhaps interesting, but what about when geometry is involved? Um, <clears throat> now, we're, we're, to narrow things down, <laughs> um, I'm going to restrict mainly to this situation. So it's really mainly, but it's, it's well, it's more general than that, but I'll come to that later. But in many cases, what you end up with is, is a manifold with boundary so that the original manifold is just the interior of your manifold with boundary. And the new stuff is just a, like a hypersurface. It's a, it's a co-dimension one sub-manifold that forms your boundary, if you like, is in the usual way of a manifold with boundary. Okay, so if we think concretely in that setting, how do we then find the geometry on the boundary? You know, if you had such a thing, um, how do you relate geometries and fields on the boundaries to, to the, 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 the equivalent things on M? You know, and what do you mean by equivalent things on M? So this will depend, of course, on how you compactify it geometrically, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, but anyway, there are lots and lots of applications. So this is, has applications in representation theory. I didn't mention that here. Um, but it, new links between different geometries, so the boundary versus M. Um, it can give a more geometric and conceptual approach to PDE boundary problems, understanding this. Um, and then scattering, which of course uses PDE boundary problems and non-local operators and lots of things like that. Okay. So... Um, let me know if there's questions at any stage. Um, I can pause, although at the end's also good. Um, okay, so Minkowski space we mentioned already, and like Euclidean space, Minkowski space goes on forever, so it's <laughs> geodesically complete and non-compact. Um, and that one's really of interest to relativity, so how do you compactify that? So here's a picture of a, a famous compactification of Minkowski space where it's mapped into what's called the Einstein cylinder. And I'm not gonna give the details of this at the moment, but basically you know what Minkowski space is and this mapping into the cylinder. So the metric on the cylinder, let me just say it, you, it's sort of minus DT squared in the vertical direction. And then it's the usual sphere metric um, in, the, in the cross section direction. So that's the sort of metric there. And this mapping, which is one to one of Minkowski into this, um, you know, this finite um, sphere, it's really a line segment across the sphere. I've got R across the sphere, but it's really just a line segment needed so far. Um, this is actually conformal. So, so again, um, sort of angles are preserved. Well, it's conformal in the Lorentzian sense. So that the Minkowski metric is a positive multiple 
of this Lorentzian cylinder metric. Now, some funny things happen, right? So if you look at this, this boundary here, the scry plus, that's the end point of null, uh, null GD6. Um, I know it is, is space-like infinity, so that's the end points of space, space-like GD6, and I plus is the end point, the, the future end point of time-like GD6. And you have scry minus and I minus for the past ends of those things. Now, there's a funny structure there. So all the null geodesics end up landing on this open set, but all the space-like ones just go to one point, which is that sort of strange feature like in stereographic projection. So here are some questions. Is this the only way to compactify Minkowski space? Um, you know, is it forced that space-like um, or time-like infinity would be just a uh, future time-like infinity of one point and space-like infinity just one point. Is that forced? Um, and is it forced that these uh, scry regions where the null GD6 end is are open regions in the boundary? So these are sort of obvious questions. And then there's an even more obvious one is why does this look so different to the compactification of Euclidean space? Okay, I'm probably going too slow. Um, <laughs> okay, so... Anyway, I don't know if this was Penrose's motivation at Einstein cylinder, but he at some stage formulated um, a kind of conformal compactification idea. And you could read that there. So it's what's called asymptotically simple. But I want you to focus on this one and two because they're the, the things that link to our notion of a compactification that we'll deal with here. So the thing you're trying to compactify ends up being an open submanifold of this compact manifold. Um, with smooth boundaries, so it's just basically a manifold with boundary um, that he's called scry. Um, and then there exists a smooth scalar field on M, in other words, a function, such that the metric G bar, which is this omega squared times the original um, space-time metric that you had, G plus, or the physical metric. Um, <clears throat> so, so G bar is just omega squared times that. Um, but that the, the boundary, you know, at infinity, the scry is the zero locus of that function. And the function um, has that its derivative is nowhere vanishing on this boundary. Now, when that happens, we would say that this function omega is a defining function for scry. Okay, so that's a notion we're going to use. Um, Okay, and then there are some more questions. You know, how, how would we rediscover the Einstein cylinder kind of conceptually? Obviously, you can play around with coordinates, which is probably what was done. Um, but how do you treat other geometries? So how do you do all this? And I will point out that you, you can rediscover that very easily, actually, from a sort of conceptual point. But let's come to that in a bit. Okay, so... <laughs> Henceforth, um, a conformal compactification, and this is a slight lie, but let's say that the henceforth, this is, will just mean um, that it's a smooth manifold with boundary with the original manifold being the interior. <clears throat> the metric G plus is the complete metric. So, so that's geodesically complete. Um, so in a sense, it's singular going to the boundary of this thing. But there'll be a metric G bar on the manifold with boundary that goes all the way to the boundary. So that's what that means. So that's a metric that goes right up to the boundary, like in this picture. And G plus will be um, R to the minus two times G bar. So this is the same as in the previous slide in the Penrose thing, um, where R is a defining function for the boundary. And that's exactly what I was saying for omega above. So the boundary is the inverse image of zero, so the boundary is the zero locus of R, and DR should be non-vanishing non everywhere on the boundary. So that's what a conformal compactification is. Now, our first observation is that you, you get a canonical conformal structure on the boundary. You don't really get a metric. It looks like you do. But what this means here is that G plus is fixed. That's your physical or geometric metric. And you only require that there exists R and G bar with these properties. So you're allowed to replace R with a different defining function. So in other words, you can multiply R by a positive function and you will get a different defining function. 
Now, when you replace R by a positive function times it, you have to rescale G bar um, in a commensurate way so that G plus doesn't change because that's the fixed object. And that conformally changes your G bar. Now, each G bar induces a metric on the boundary, but now you're allowed to conformally change them in the way I just said. So that's why you just get a conformal structure on the boundary. So one way conformal compactification is used is as a machine for studying conformal geometry on a boundary like this um, with its links to a Riemannian or a pseudo-Riemannian geometry on the interior. But I guess, you know, since we're talking about relativity, we're more thinking about the problem of we have a space-time and we want to compactify it here. Anyway, um, as terminology, we'll say G plus is conformally compact, if you can do all that above. Um, and um, um, by the way, I'm dealing with the case where dr is not null. <laughs> so I'm going to restrict to that case here. Um, so it doesn't quite do the Einstein cylinder above, although again, as I say, that will really turn up later on anyway. Um, and then, so G plus is called conformally compact um, and, and it's called Poincare Einstein if it's also Einstein. Well, some people would just say that if it was negative Einstein and this were Riemannian signature, but you know, just to keep things simple, I'll, I'll use that terminology. Okay, so there's been some talk about conformal geometry. Um, these questions above are just reminding the questions we already had. Um, conformal geometry, roughly speaking, is a geometry with angle, but not length. Um, and more precisely, it's gonna consist of a manifold and a thing C. And the thing C is just an equivalence class of conformally related metrics. Okay, so um, conformally related means that the two metrics G and G prime are in this equivalence class if and only if one is a positive function times the other. And then if we draw one of these pictures like we had for pseudo-Romanian geometry, it's a manifold with a tangent space at each point is now not equipped with a um, pseudo uh, Riemannian in a product, but or pseudo Euclidean in a product, but rather that modulo dilations. So in the Riemannian sig signature, it's modulo, um, you know, just R. So it, it gives you the similarity transformations that you do at school, you know, where triangles are similar if they have the same angles, um, they don't have to be the same size. Okay. Um, so, by the way, the tangent space is equipped like that, but in a point-dependent way. Okay, so here's just a word from our sponsor about why conformal geometry um, <laughs> is good for, for, for humankind. Um, so, first of all, um, reminding that the equations of electromagnetism, I've given the source-free ones there, are just not just Lorentz invariant, but conformally invariant. So remember actually that the Lorentz invariance of those equations was the whole drive behind the Michelson-Morley experiments and special relativity. But in fact, the same equations are conformally invariant. So, so this has led to a um, sort of long held belief that underlying physics is um, conformal geometry should play a big role. And it turns out indeed that for instance, the Yang-Mills equations that govern the, govern the weak and strong force, force are also conformally invariant in dimension four. Um, so that's another sort of thing. The ADS CFT correspondence and string theory has a lot to do with conformal geometry. And there are various other things I've mentioned here. Um, but just to jump down, you know, our, our motivation is going to be this geometric compactification at the moment. So, yeah, so I, there is something else important, though, which is that conformal geometry is important just for Romanian and pseudo Romanian geometry, even if you just want to study those. Okay, so we're on to part two, which is conformal geometry and the geometry of scale. So I don't know if I'm speaking too quickly. I possibly am, but I'll try and slow down slightly now. Um, okay, so <clears throat> because there's no distinguished metric on a conformal manifold, so remember, so here's a conformal manifold, bold C here's an equivalence class of metrics, that are conformally related, um, then it, it becomes the case that an important role is played by what's called density bundles. They're sort of secretly important in Romanian and pseudo-Romanian geometry, but, but 
<clears throat> they, they get trivialized by the choice of metric. And so, so that's why you don't think about them much, but they do play a role. Um, so how do you construct density bundles? If you're new to this, well, first of all, we're in dimension D. The tangent bundle has rank D. TM is the tangent bundle. So it's top exterior power, you know, when you wedge over D indices, if you like, um, that has, has rank one. So, so lambda D or wedge D of the tangent bundle has rank one, meaning it's a line bundle. And if you square that line bundle, if you take its tensor product with itself, that's what the wedge two means, then you get an oriented real line bundle. So let's call it curly K. Um, and then because that's oriented, you can take roots easily. There's an obvious way of taking roots of such a bundle just because there's an obvious way of taking roots of positive numbers. Okay, and so here's the convention. So these are line bundles that are oriented themselves um, that are just roots of that um, sort of canonical bundle. Okay, and that gives the convention for weights. And then the usual trivial bundle, the bundle of just functions is the ones with weight zero. Um, and then we put a plus here for positive elements. Now, using this notation on a conformal manifold, you don't have a metric, but you do have what's called a conformal metric. Okay, so, so this is um, like a metric, it's a section of the symmetric tensor power of the cotangent bundle that's non-degenerate, you know, has the signature we want, um, but it has a conformal weight. So in other words, it's a tensor, it's that bundle tensored with these densities of weight two. That's what that means. Now, when you have the conformal metric, but you know, by its definition, you get a metric from the conformal class back by multiplying the conformal metric by a positive density, so a positive section of one of those line bundles. Um, so you take its minus two power, and that gives you something in weight zero, and that's how you get a metric back. Okay, then with all this tautological nonsense, then the, the dth sort of tensor power of this uh, conformal metric by contracting an indices basically gives you the mapping from um, this top exterior power of the tangent bundle that identifies it with the density bundle. So there's a kind of way of making that all slick. Um, but anyway, the main thing to remember is that you have those things and that um, there's a one-to-one -one relation between these positive sections of this line bundle and metrics by just doing this um, sigma to the minus two bold G. And when we have a positive section of that bundle, we'll therefore call it a strict scale because it gives us um, the scale part in the language of physics, you know, from the conformal class, it gives us the, the lengths. And the other thing I would like you to know is that the levi sevita connection um, for any metric in the conformal class acts on these densities, which is obvious because, you know, the, 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 this density bundle is just a, coming from tensor powers of the tangent bundle. So of course the levi sevita connection acts on there. Um, and that things are set up or that has the property that any one of these levi sevita connections um, for the metric, well, they, any one of them acts on here, but if you take the, the levi sevita connection for the metric determined by sigma, so this metric here, determined by sigma in that way, then that levi sevita connection actually preserves sigma, so sigma is parallel for that one. So this is sort of important in our calculations. So sigma is parallel for the levi sevita connection that it determines by determining the metric and then using the Cazor formula. Okay. Now, the basic problem in conformal geometry is that um, it's not as rigid as pseudo-Romanian geometry. <laughs> so um, meaning that exactly what we said. So the metric determines the levi sevita connection and so on, and you get um, all these invariants and everything and nice ways of making equations, very simple. So how do we get a handle on things in conformal geometry um, and in particular geometric analysis? So how would you start it? So the, the big problem is that there's no metric on the tangent bundle, only an equivalence class. And so no connection on the tangent bundle, no distinguished one. Right? You can impose ones, but not one determined by the, 
by the geometry. Okay. Um, now, one thing you can say was, you know, this is what was mainly done historically. You just pick a metric from the conformal class and you say, okay, well, now I do have a levy sevita connection and I'll try and work with that. But that's fraught with difficulty, um, as you'll see, because if you replace it with a conformally related metric that's also in the, in the conformal class, um, then how do things change? Well, here we have tangent vector fields, that's what that notation means. And here's how the levi sevita connection behaves dealing with those tangent vector fields. So the derivative of eta along this uh, C or whatever it is, um, transforms when you change the metric in this conformal way by this mess, okay? So you have these epsilons, which is some sort of one form, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and the one form here is the derivative of log of this function that you scale by. So that's how the levi sevita connection behaves. What about the Laplacian? That's an important operator for analysis. Well, that's how the Laplacian behaves. So in dimension two, it's very good. It's almost invariant, and that's you know used famously and very important. But in other dimensions, um, it, it doesn't. And you can see I've slipped into leaving an N there instead of using D. So that was my mistake. Okay, but anyway, um, the, the you know this is already a mess, but this these problems increase exponentially with order. You know, so if you have like a sixth order operator, it's just pages and pages of of mess when you change the metric. Okay, but that's the bad news. Um, the good news is that there's a solution. So there is a metric and a connection on a slightly larger bundle. Um, you know, so this is the thing I'm often talking about, as you know. So let's let's rediscover it in a sense. So first of all, we go back to school and we discover the conformal sphere. So I always tell people if you've got young children and you want them to um, learn that conformal geometry is natural, then you draw this picture. So, so what we've got here is on the left side, we've got Minkowski space again. So here, there's the Minkowski metric. Um, so but we're in dimension D plus two. Why not? Okay. So we have our null cone, and here's the future part of the null cone. So I'm picking an orientation or time orientation. That's the future null cone. Now, what I'm going to do is take the, the ray projectivization of that null cone. In other words, each null ray that goes up this cone you know, like a null line, but a null ray. So each of them is going to become one point. So that's what you mean by ray projectivization of this forward null cone. And when you do that, you get a sphere. So in the dimensions I've picked, we would get a, um, a D-dimensional sphere. Now I'm claiming that it actually has a canonical, this is sort of reasonably obvious, sort of topologically speaking or whatever, um, that you get a sphere. But I'm claiming that it gets a conformal structure, which is a little less obvious. And that's exactly what it gets. That's the claim. So it doesn't get a metric in an equivalence. You know, you don't first get a metric and then forget about something. You actually first get a conformal structure by this picture. That's why it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so how do you see that? Well, what you do is you take a section back of this projectivization, right? So think of this as a bundle over that, you're just taking a section of that bundle. In other words, you take a map from the sphere back to the cone with the property that when you compose that map back with this projection forward, you get the identity. Okay, so that's what it means, a section. So then you get a section that you would draw here in the obvious way, and this is the big disadvantage of not being there with a board. <laughs> so I'd normally draw on this thing. But imagine a section drawn here. Well, on that section, you get induced a metric by just sort of restricting this ambient metric, this, this Lorentzian one. And actually, you find that you, you, get a, you get a Riemannian signature metric if you do this. So, so you, you, know, you take a section of this, you get a Riemannian signature metric induced on the sphere. Now, of course, we don't have such a section. So we, we made a choice when we made a section. So let's take a different section and then you get a different met metric on the sphere, but they are conformally related. 
So different choices of sections give you conformally related metrics. So that means that the sphere canonically has a conformal structure. And if you take the right section here, it's easy to see that you get the round sphere metric. So in fact, you're getting the conformal structure of the round sphere this way. Okay, so we, we have, in, you know, we've discovered a sort of natural conformal structure. <clears throat> and now it turns out that we can also, just by staring at this, see how we get this, this connection that is on um, a bundle that's slightly larger than the tangent bundle. So this is a conformal structure, so there's no distinguished connection on the tangent bundle. But over here, we have Minkowski space, which in particular is an affine space. Now, affine spaces, by definition, have flat connections because they have parallel transport of vectors. We know what it means in an affine space. So, so, <clears throat> so um, Rd plus 2, or Minkowski spaces we're thinking about, has a connection. And what you do is you take that notion of parallel transport of ambient tangent vectors and restrict it to this cone, right? So we know how to transport tangent vectors to Rd plus 2, we know how to trans parallelly transport them on this cone. Then we make an identification and say that vectors are equivalent if they're on the same ray and happen to be truly parallel. In other words, one is a parallel transport of the other. Okay, then under that identification, you see that things have descended now to a vector bundle on the sphere that has a notion of parallel transport. Okay, and we call that the tractor bundle. And it has the tractor connection that we just constructed. Now, what's more, there's a metric because this ambient Lorentzian dot product um, gives us a metric, you know, a, a sort of way of dotting together such vectors. And it's easy to see that, that that descends under this map to a metric on this on this bundle. And what's more, it's of course parallel because you know, look at the way it's given. So it's parallel for this parallel transport that we define. So this metric is preserved by this connection that we've constructed. So we, in this way, we easily get a Lorentzian signature metric on this vector bundle on the sphere, and the vector bundle has rank D plus two. And it also has a composition series because um, sitting in the tangent space to um, Rd plus 2, you have the tangent space to the cone, and inside the tangent space to the cone, you have the vertical direction. So, so you get a composition series that I'm sort of indicating with this direct sum here. Okay. Now, that was the Romanian signature model, and you might say, well, that's annoying, Rod, because we're, we're all um, relativity people. Um, how do we do this um, in signature? But it just works all the same. So if you take Rd plus 2 with instead this um, bilinear form of signature um, uh, D comma 2, then you get a quadric like this, and the ray projectivization is an S1 cross Sn. Remember, D is n plus 1, um, that has a Lorentzian signature conformal structure. And it's conformally flat for the same reason. Well. I didn't say the other was conformally flat, but it is. And the reason it's conformally flat is really because this tractor connection is flat, but we we'll, don't need to worry about that at the moment. Okay, so, so this is how you do a Lorentzian signature version of the same thing. Okay, well, as is well known probably by everyone there, this generalizes, so on general con curved conformal manifolds, um, you get this um, tractor connection, um, and um, with them, you know, there's a tractor bundle, which has the same rank as I was just talking about in that case. Um, if the conformal structure is signature PQ, then this thing has signature P plus one, Q plus one. Um, it has a metric like that that's preserved by the connection that you get. And there's this canonical conformally invariant connection. This is a Cartan connection. It's the most common language that was independently discovered in this way by uh, Thomas, though not in the language of vector bundles. Moral, morally the same thing. There's also something important that gives this filtration. There's a thing that um, is often called the canonical tractor, but perhaps should be called the position tractor. Um, and that gives us the filtration. So it tells us how this, um, but this, this line bundle, this, this density bundle, weight minus one, injects into the tangent bundle. And it, the, the adjoint of it gives the map out to that part. 
Okay, so there, so there is a bundle like that. Um, so in summary, on a conformal manifold, there's no distinguished connection on the tangent bundle, but we have a conformally invariant uh, connection that preserves a metric on this bundle of rank just two more than the tangent bundle, and that's the tractor bundle. And here's a formula for it in, in you know, giving the, the gritty details. So this thing's given by a triple where sigma lives in there, rho lives in that line bundle and so on, mu lives in there, um, <clears throat> and then an explicit formula. This P here, this is the Scouten tensor, which is just a trace modification of the Ricci tensor. Um, the details in some sense don't matter too much. There's the conformal metric. Main thing, there is a formula, and here's the formula for the metric that's preserved by this connection um, given as a quadratic form. Importantly, there's also a second order operator that sometimes or nowadays often called the Thomas operator, because Thomas had also noticed this. Um, we used to call it the tractor D operator, but it's second order. Um, in the top slot here, mapping into this part, if you like, there's just some numbers times the density or tractor you act on, and then a derivative of it. This, if it's a density, that's the levi -Sivita. If this is a tractor, it's the levi -Sivita coupled with um, the tractor connection. And similarly, you know, this is the Parsian thing in the bottom, and that's conformally invariant. Okay, now what does it mean um, for a tractor to be parallel? Um, so something important happens here that if you have a section of that bundle um, and it's parallel, what, what, what do we know? Well, one thing is that um, a very simple observation that if this is parallel for the tractor connection, then it has to be in the image of a, of a linear differential operator acting on a density of weight one, okay? <laughs> so I didn't say it was a density of weight one, but it is. So if, if I is parallel, the top slot's always a density of weight one, if that's a weight zero tractor, um, then it's actually in the image of that Thomas D operator that I just mentioned. Now, because it's in the image of a linear differential operator, if it, that means that if it's parallel and not zero, then the top slot has to be non-vanishing on an open dense set because the whole tractor is just a differential operator on that. So if it vanished on a neighborhood, then the, you know, the, the I would vanish, the parallel thing would vanish, which we're, we're saying it doesn't. Okay, so when you have a parallel tractor, the sigma in the top slot's non-vanishing on an open dense set. And moreover, on that set where sigma's nowhere vanishing, the, the, the scale that it determines, the sigma that it determines, gives you an Einstein metric in the way we got metrics from the conformal metric. And conversely, um, if you have a, an Einstein metric, then, then the corresponding scale sigma, and you take this Thomas D on it and so on, you get a parallel tractor. Now to see the proof of this is just trivial, you just use this formula. And remember that when you work in the scale of the, of the density sigma, then the levi sivita connection preserves sigma. And if this thing's parallel, then mu is the derivative of sigma. That's what the first equation is telling us because this would be grad sigma minus mu equals zero. Um, so this becomes two derivatives of sigma here and they would both vanish because they're levi sivita connections on the sigma that determines those levi sivita connections. And so you're left basically with this um, being equal to zero, which is exactly the Einstein condition. In, in my talk, you know, these are source-free uh, sort of vacuum Einstein equations with a cosmological constant, if you like. Um, okay, and then the converse is easy. So, you know, if, if, if it's Einstein, then you also see that this thing's parallel. Um, but <clears throat> this is Einstein with, where sigma's not zero, um, but, this gives us a way of generalizing the notion of Einstein by just saying that you have a conformal structure with a parallel tractor, right? So I say that's almost Einstein because on an open dense set, it's Einstein. And then the, 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 the sigma, if you like, tells you smoothly how you're taking that notion to where, to where it's zero, or the I does through the scale tractor. Okay, so what does the zero locus look like? So if you have one of these parallel um, tractors, then the top slot's non vanishing on an open dense set. But what is the zero locus of that top slot? What does it look like? Well, if, if the length according to the tractor metric, this I squared means the length according to the tractor metric, if that's not zero, then the zero locus has to be either empty or a smoothly embedded separating hypersurface. 
So it's very restrictive. And if it's if it's of length zero, then it's almost the same away from some isolated points. Okay, it still has to be a smooth hypersurface apart from some isolated points. Now, the proof of that follows from some curved orbit theorem that I mentioned in the next lecture, but most of this is almost trivial, especially this first one. So I'm going to talk about it in a more elementary sense. But before I do that, here's a picture. So if you have a parallel tractor and its length, according to the tractor matrix, not zero, then your manifold um, is, is sort of partitioned into these parts um, where the, the sigma is negative and positive and zero. And in fact, it'll turn out to be the bit where it's zero has a conformal structure, and we'll be able to show that these other bits are each conformally compact with this being the zero locus being the conformal infinity. So what you get is a gluing of conformally compact manifolds along the conformal infinity. And the picture's a little deceiving because M, M0 may not be connected. So, you know, so that this take the picture with a grain of salt in that sense. Okay. Um, okay, so let's try and generalize now. So we sort of parallel gives us a very, very restrictive condition. Uh, so parallel tractors, but what about if you drop that and we try to understand all conformally compact? Because we just sort of discovered that the Poincare Einstein ones arise from these parallel things. So 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 just to go back, I mean, each of these pieces is actually Poincaré-Einstein because it's conformally compact and Einstein. Okay, so if we want to drop that, so we what we'll do is we'll say that a conformal manifold equipped with a sigma section of densities of weight one is almost pseudo-Romanian if the, if the tractor that you form with the Thomas D acting on it is nowhere zero. So it turns out that that's a good condition, and, and then I'll call that a scale tractor. So this slightly generalizes Romanian, pseudo-Romanian, um, because then again we get the condition that sigma is non-zero on an open dense set by basically the same argument, so I won't repeat it, right? It's just because this is part of the two-jet, so sigma can't vanish on a neighborhood if, if this thing's nowhere vanishing, the whole thing. Okay, and then in that language, a conformally compact manifold, now a general one, not necessarily Einstein, is almost pseudo-Romanian, um, <clears throat> um, but with just the property that the sigma defines the boundary. In other words, the boundary will be the zero locus of this density sigma, and the derivative of sigma will be nowhere vanishing along that zero locus. So that's what conformally compact means in this language. Um, now, there's a nice thing to do with the scalar curve, which I'm just about out of time, so I'll go reasonably quickly. Um, so when you use the explicit formula for the metric, here's what happens when you square that scale tractor. You get this thing that looks quite messy. But if you compute where sigma is not zero, <coughs> which, you know, it has to be almost everywhere, everywhere. Um, then and you compute in the scale of sigma, then all these derivatives of sigma go away and you're left with I squared is just basically the scalar curvature up to a constant and a sign. So, so the length of the scale tractor gives you a generalization of the scalar curvature that extends up uh, you know, into the zero locus of sigma. So it extends to where the metric is singular. So that's very useful. Turns out to have a lot of applications. Um, and so you can have the notion of um, what I call almost scalar constant, which means that this I squared is constant. And that generalizes the notion of scale, um, the scalar curvature being constant. And of course, we get a similar result to what you have in the Einstein case. Remember that if a metric is Einstein, then the scalar curvature has to be constant. And in fact, if it's almost Einstein, then this generalized curvature has to be constant, simply because the I is parallel and the metric's preserved. So, so the length squared is, is also parallel. Okay, um, so what I want to say is we get more or less the same picture if we now just look at the case that I squared is nowhere vanishing. So we have a scale tractor, we ask that its length squared is nowhere vanishing, um, and then the zero locus of the top slot of that scale tractor, um, if non-empty, will be like the first version of that previous theorem. In other words, it'll be a smoothly embedded hypersurface and you can work out statements about it's normal in an obvious way that I've got written there, but 
I'll skip over because we're running out of time. Um, and the key aspect of the proof is just that along the zero locus, when you look at this formula for I squared, this term drops out. And so I squared really just gives you the, the length, if you like, of the, of the co-normal that sigma defines. Okay, so this has weight one. This inverse conformal metric has weight minus two. So this ends up being a weight zero thing. So in particular, if I squared is nowhere vanishing, then, then the sigma must have derivative that's nowhere vanishing wherever sigma was vanishing, right? So it's a defining density for its zero locus. And that's, um, that's how you see that the zero locus is a smoothly embedded hypersurface. So when you have um, a conformal manifold equipped with a scale tractor such that its length's not zero according to the tractor metric, and this is in any signature, then um, <clears throat> you get that the manifold decomposes like in the previous picture, and each of these components is conformally compact with this M0 being a conformal infinity with a conformal structure, just automatically. And all conformally compact manifolds with the scalar curvature not sort of bounded away from zero arise this way. That's what the asterisk is about. So all conformally compact manifolds arise this way, at least in the case that they have scalar curvature bounded away from zero. For instance, constant. Okay, so the moral, and I, I will justify this more in the next talk, is that we should replace, if you're interested in conformal compactification, you should replace looking at your pseudo Riemannian manifold with just thinking of it as your manifold equipped with the underlying conformal structure of that. Um, this is now an M bar, so manifold with boundary, um, and equipped with, with a scale tractor um, such that you know, the, the boundary is going to be the zero locus of that scale tractor. So this, this really generalizes our notion of geometry because now this, you know, everything here smoothly goes up to this boundary where the metric is singular. So this gives us a sort of more general notion and, and away from the boundary, it exactly recovers all the data that you had here. I mean, exactly recovers it, no more, no less. So it's a very, very kind of cute extension that's very sharp. Um, and for example, as I just mentioned, a conformal compactification is easily understood that way. It literally means you have a manifold with boundary. Um, oh yeah, I thought I was talking about manifold with boundary up there, wasn't I? I couldn't see the top of my screen. Um, so you have a manifold with boundary with a conformal structure and the top slot of, of your scale tractor defines the boundary. Okay, so just a word for next time. So in pseudo-Romanian geometry, remember, for instance, how you produce the Laplacian. So you're coupling geometry to things for analysis like differential operators. Um, in this way, the metric plus the levi sevier connections give you the Laplacian. Now we want to couple the conformal structure, um, you know, conformal operators to, to sigma and the scale tractor. And that will give us a generalization of this sort of coupling from pseudo-Romanian geometry. And it turns out that that um, is extremely powerful for our sort of our studying our compactification. So understanding how to extend fields off the boundary at infinity and so on. So I'll come to all that next time. Okay, that's the end of this one. Five minutes hey. over time, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Well, are there are there any any questions um, either in the audience or over Zoom? Yes, okay. of course. Yes. Um, hi, Rod. Um, uh, so, um, if um, uh, so, if you look to projective geometry, right? So there is like one point compactification of Euclidean space. It's sphere, right? But we can also projectivize it to projective space, which has a bit more boundary. And one point central central projection yes yes central projection for for sphere right but but yeah. we can also do projectization like uh, R P N inside yeah R P N minus yeah so 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 yeah. R N inside R P N standard yeah standard, right so uh, so here there are several right so um, do you talk about kind of minimal compactifications or do do you have well this idea or um no what do you mean by minimal in that sense well because like this here's two projective complications right so um and uh, there's two projective are... ones yeah there's a projective to the hemisphere and then there's the projective to rpn yeah yeah so um, um so, so what distinguishes a bit between you like automorphism well what distinguishes those ones for us is orientability um the 
I mean, an interesting question that I think is related to what you're talking about is uniqueness. And in general, we don't know how to answer the uniqueness of our compactification. In some cases, as you know, we do. <laughs> Namely, we know, for instance, that stereographic projection is the only way to compactify Euclidean space. But beyond that, I don't know how to answer that question, even for these geometric ones. Although I suspect that the sort of ideas that Mike and I used in our treatment of Euclidean space would in fact answer these questions to some extent. Um, you know, the difference between compactifying projective space to the hemisphere compared to RPN is just identifying antipodal points on the boundary, right? So, yeah. so locally they're the same in a sense. Um, and it's probably hard to distinguish situations from that using geometry apart from, you know, in the end saying something about orientability or something. But, but to get a local result that it has to be one or other of those things, which I'm sure it does, right? I'm, I'm sure there's a theorem which says the only way to projectively compactify you put in space is one of those two. Um, but yeah, to, so I think that one could prove locally that using geometric ideas like Mike and I used, which was a sort of volume growth idea. Um, but yeah, the answer is at the moment, we don't officially know. <laughs> but I guess at least I'm optimistic that those sort of ideas could be used. Yep. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. So thank you.